turn in your Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 30. Deuteronomy in chapter number 30, and we're going to look at something that I'm excited about. Um, it's a, uh, actually something I did for Children's Church a while back, and so I've kind of adapted it for uh, adult Sunday school, so hopefully uh, it'll be good for you. Deuteronomy chapter 30, and we'll begin in verse 1, and it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee. The blessing and the cursing which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations, whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee, and shalt return unto the Lord thy God, and shalt obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, with all thine heart and with all thy soul, that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee, and will return and gather thee from all the nations, whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. If any of thine be driven out unto the outermost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence he will fetch thee. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it. And he will do thee good, and multiply thee above thy fathers. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart, and the heart of thy seed, to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. And the Lord thy God will put all these curses upon thine enemies, and on them that hate thee, which persecuted thee. And thou shalt return and obey the voice of the Lord, and do all his commandments which I command thee this day. And the Lord thy God will make thee plenteous in every work of thine hand, in the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of thy cattle, and in the fruit of thy land for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over thee for good, as he rejoiced over thy fathers. And then verse 10, If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments, and his statutes, which are written in this book of the law. And if thou turn unto the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thine soul. So, for the kids, I read this little story, so I'll read it to you guys too. An uncle of R.U. Darby was caught by the gold fever in the gold rush days and went west to dig and grow rich. He staked a claim and went to work with pick and shovel. After weeks of labor, he was rewarded by the discovery of the shining ore. He needed machinery to bring the ore to the surface. Quietly, he covered up the mine and retraced his footsteps to his home in Williamsburg, Maryland. Told his relatives and a few neighbors of the strike, they got together money needed for the machinery and had it shipped. The uncle and Darby went back to work on the mine. The first car of ore was mined and shipped to the smelter. The returns proved they had one of the richest mines in Colorado. A few more cars and the ore would clear the debts. Then would come the big killing profits. Down went the drills. Up went the hopes of Darby and the uncle. Then something happened. The vein of gold ore disappeared. They had come to the end of the rainbow, and the pot of gold was no longer there. They drilled on, desperately trying to pick up the vein again, all to no avail. Finally, they decided to quit. They sold the machinery to a junk man for a few hundred dollars and took the train back home. The junk man called in a mining engineer to look at the mine and do a little calculating. The engineer advised that the project had failed because the owners were not familiar with fault lines. His calculation showed that the vein would be found just three feet from where the Darbys had stopped drilling, and that is exactly where it was found. 
the junk man took millions of dollars in ore from the mine because he knew enough to seek expert counsel before giving up. So we're often like, are you Darby and his uncle? We think we know what is best in our own, in our own mind, in our own way of thinking. We don't seek expert advice or someone who knows more. And because of that, we miss out on something that's wonderful. So in Deuteronomy chapter number 30, Moses is giving us reasons that we should listen to God and we should obey his commandments. And so we're going to talk about some things that this passage shows us that God's commandments are and uh, why we should be following them. So God's commandments are, first of all, obvious. And we can see this in um, the next verse that we didn't read. Verse number 11 says, For this commandment which I command thee this day is not hidden from thee. God's commands aren't hidden from us. God doesn't hide them away and make them difficult to understand and to find. He makes them clear. God's commands are clear. And they're in his word. They're obvious. They're not hidden. The second thing God's commands are in, are in the same verse. It says, For this commandment which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. God's commands aren't far off. And then the next two verses give us illustrations of how far, how not far off God's commandments are. Verse number 12 says, It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, Who shall go up to heaven and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it? You don't have to say, Well, God's commands, I don't know what they are. God wrote them all up into heaven, and we don't know what they are. We can't find out what they are. We need someone to go up to heaven find out what they are and come back from heaven and bring them back to us. Obviously that doesn't happen. People don't do that. That's not a normal occurrence for someone to uh, be in heaven and then come back. But God's commands aren't like that. We don't have to have someone who goes up to heaven and comes back to know what God's commands are. He gave them to us in the Bible. We have them here for us. And then the next verse gives another illustration of how not far God's commands are. Verse number 13 says, Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, Who shall go over the sea for us, and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it. So again, it's not, so this is like a little more um, what could actually happen, what you might think would actually happen, where... Uh, God's commands, well, they're, they're given by this one, this one place over here. Or there's, there's only this one person over here who has God's commands. And so we need to go over the sea to hear what they have to say, to bring God's commands back to us to know what they are. No, God gave us his commands, and we have them. They are not far. So God's commands are obvious, and God's commands are near. Next, God's commands are clear. Verse number 15 says, See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. I'm not sure how much clearer you could get than life and good and death and evil. These, these are very opposite things here. There's no question of which which of these you should pick, which direction you should go. God's commands are clear. He makes them clear to us of what we should do and how we should live. So God's commands are obvious. God com God's commands are near. God's commands are clear. 
And then the next one is God's commands are beneficial. We see that in verse 16. In that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. So, if God's commands were just obvious, near, and clear, we, we still might not want to follow God's commands. Okay, yes, uh, the, they're, it's obvious what God wants us to do. It's right here. It's near. Um, it's, it's clear. There's no question about what God wants. But if, there was, if, if it was something bad, if it was something detrimental to us, we still wouldn't want to do it. But that's not the case. God's commands are beneficial. And this verse specifically says... Um, Um, it specifically says that thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee. God's commands are beneficial. So God's commands are obvious, near, clear, beneficial. And then verse 17 and 18, God's commands are better, better than any alternative. Verse 17, but if thine heart turn away so that thou wilt not hear, but shalt be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish, and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land whither the Lord, or whither thou passest over Jordan to go to possess it. God's commands are better. They're better than any alternative that we could look at, that we could think about, that we could have. God's commands are better. So God's commands are obvious, they're near, they're clear, they're beneficial, they're better. And then verse 19 and 20, God's commands are your choice. Verse number 19 says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. So God's commands are a choice. We aren't, we aren't forced into following God's commands. We aren't told that, or we aren't automatons that we just are made to do what he says. They're our choice. We're given a choice whether to follow them. And we, so we have to daily make a choice to follow God's commands. Verse 19 says, I have set before you life and death. Our choice, life or death. Which do you want? Our choice, blessing and cursing. Blessing and cursing. Clear choice here. But then it says, Therefore, choose life. So we must choose, choose life. And how do we choose that? We choose that by following God's commands, by doing what he asks us to. So God's commands are obvious. They are near they are clear, they are beneficial, they are better, and they are your choice. <clears throat> we have a choice whether we're going to follow God's commands or not. And that's clearly laid out for your, us here. 
So, we need to not be like Darby and his uncle, who they didn't seek um, expert counsel. In this case, our expert counsel is God's counsel, the counsel that comes from him when he tells us in his word what to do. They didn't seek it out, so they missed out on uh, the benefits of doing so. And we'll miss out on the benefits of doing so as well if we don't seek out God's counsel and follow his commands. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I do thank you for this uh, fascinating passage in Deuteronomy about uh, following your commands. And I pray that you would help us to recognize them as as the best thing for us, as something that uh, is good for us, that is beneficial, and something, uh, give us the, the desire and the determination to choose to follow your commands, to not just uh, go through life half-heartedly or um, thinking of our own way is best, but help us to choose to follow your word, to follow your commands, and the Bible I ask in Jesus' name. And apparently, I went much shorter <laughs> because this is a children's church lesson, and children's church doesn't take off for long. I thought I had adjusted it accordingly, but apparently not. So we have some free time before the morning service at 11.